We now return to the State Journal's Decision Makers. And welcome back to Morgantown. We're again at the Hall of Traditions in the WVU Practice Facility. We're joined now by the Dean of the West Virginia College of Business and Economics, Dean Zito Zartarelli. And Zito, I still am in total disbelief in what you have been able to do in such a short period of time to restore integrity and dignity to the School of Economics, and I think it's spread throughout the whole institution. But you did something very special when you just announced that you and your wife are giving $100,000 to a scholarship fund for the College of Business and Economics. I don't know that I've ever heard of a dean doing a gift like that. Right. Well, well uh, why did you do it? First of all, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And uh, well, Bray, I think uh, sometimes we have to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. But more importantly, I think it's just a function of uh, giving back. And I do believe that since I'm the dean of the school, I believe in our vision. Um, I believe that to build a great school, we're going to have to have great students, great faculty, great programs, great facilities, and eventually a great name but starts with the students. And so I felt that, both Kathy and I felt that it was appropriate for us to, as part of the campaign, uh, to contribute. And so we set up a scholarship. Uh, it's already funded, fully funded, uh, so that we can attract the best. In fact, one of the requirements is a 3.8 average uh, for the students coming in. So we want to elevate the, uh, the game, so to speak, and bring in more quality, more quality students to the college. Uh, and I do hope that that will also motivate other folks, uh, either graduates from the school or not, uh, to contribute. Because I think it's a great mission to build a great school of uh, business economics in the state, and this is part of that effort. I, I guess the question, the, the natural question that, that sort of comes out of this, you, you grew up in South America. You, you became so highly respected in the business world by running the Johnson and Johnson, Johnson and Johnson Pacific Rim operation. I mean, it, it, it's an amazing that people really took the time to see what you've done in the business world. You adopt West Virginia. You come here uh, with a, a school that's really in trouble and start to build it back. And it's almost like You've adopted us, and, and, right. and you're part of us, and you're right. living and breathing and acting like you're a West Virginian, and we are, I mean, it's an amazing thing. Well, I think it, it goes two ways, uh, and so both Kathy and I feel very comfortable here. We've been extremely well received throughout the state, uh, from top to bottom, and uh, we have met just great people, and so they have been, they have embraced us. They've been very gracious, very hospitable to us, and so I think it's a natural. Uh, I, you know, uh, when people are being nice to you, you've got to be nice to them. And, uh, but uh, in addition to that, I normally tend to be nice to people anyway. <laughs> but it so happens that West Virginians in particular, they, are, uh, they have a very special knack of making sure that you feel home. And so both Kath and I feel very much at home here. Before we get to the meat of the interview, I do want to ask you one more. Could, I, I mean, it seems like every month I read a new I guess honor or ranking that's bestowed upon this College of Business and Economics in terms of whether it's the best value for the money right. or whether it's the, the, the ranking of business schools. What's brought all that about and what are some of the highlights that we ought to know about that? Well, I think uh, I'm very proud, we're very proud of uh, three rankings that came out uh, uh, this year, in fact. The first one was uh, Business Week ranking us number five best in the country uh, in terms of our our undergraduate program in, in business ethics, very important to us. We, even prior to my coming, but even uh, with my coming, we incentivize and, and spend more time and money to build a program that teaches students about business ethics. And I think it's starting to produce results, which I, I think is great. We even have a business uh, ethics uh, club in the college with more than 60 students. I recently met with the students, the president, the vice president, et cetera, just terrific kids. And they're so eager to learn uh, about what is right and what is wrong in business. The second one. I hate yes, to interrupt you, sure. but I'd like you to open that up as a free class for, for, for a more lot. People. Yeah, exactly. Maybe start in Mingo County. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go That's ahead. Right. The second one that has made us very proud uh, was also Business Week ranking as number ninth best in terms of our return on investment. They basically compare how much a student, a typical student from West Virginia, would pay 
uh, to go to school here, which is $6,500 uh, of tuition a year, one of the lowest in the country, and how much would they get upon graduation? And so on average now, our graduates uh, leave the school and they make $45,000 on average. So that gave us a ratio of about 7.3 to 1 or something. They compared that against a lot of schools in the country and we ranked number ninth. Wow. So uh, that makes us very proud. So it's all about value, right? On one hand, uh, we're talking about economic value to parents and to students. On the other hand, we're talking about ethics as a value set. We need so both. <laughs> we need both, right. Let's, uh, you all started a, a statewide tour, and I know you're going to be in Wheeling talking about the economic forecast for West Virginia on the 15th of October, right. and ultimately in Martinsburg, and you said, I think next year you're Next year we're uh, aiming to go to Backley also. Okay, but this week you started down in Charleston, Charleston. Right. and you, you gave a, I mean, there's a wonderful report that people can download online, we'll put it on our website, but my question is, why don't you give us sort of a summary of the West Virginia economy for 2014, what we can look forward to, right. and sort of where we are? Uh, let me just focus on really probably three elements of that. One is uh, employment. And so uh, this past year, the economy of West Virginia added about 3,000 uh, jobs, uh, mostly in the mining, uh, natural resource and mining sector, which makes sense because of yeah. the gas uh, explosion uh, industry and so on and so forth. So that's important there. Uh, the second element, I think it's the uh, income, what we call personal, uh, per capita personal income. And we have uh, had the past several years, in fact, uh, very nice growth, better than the U.S. in total. Right. In fact, uh, that brought us up to about 34,000 in a few dollars on the average per capita personal income, which is very good. Uh, that growth that we have experienced in the past uh, two or three years has been best in the national average, uh, which is kind of unusual for us because we, we normally don't beat the national average, but on that one we did. And when we look forward, uh, the same thing uh, seems to be happening. We're looking now in terms of employment. Uh, we now are looking, by 2005 years from now, we're looking at 4.5%. That's the projection now, which is going to be a lot better than the national average. We're looking at personal income, the per capita personal income, not growing as fast as it has in the past, but uh, slightly less than U.S. Uh, average. And we're also noticing is that uh, uh, in some sectors, particularly, uh, for example, uh, 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 health care and education, uh, 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 business, uh, financial business, and so on and so forth, the, the employability of those sectors seem to be a lot better as we project uh, forward. We are also sensing that in terms of natural resource and mining, we're not going to see the type of uh, uh, report we have had. Uh, we're also, uh, one thing that's interesting I'd like to mention is that uh, the importance of exports in, in the West Virginia economy. Uh, in 2000, uh, in terms of the gross domestic product of West Virginia, exports represented about 5% or so. This past year represented 16%. As, and that's going to grow as coal exports grow. I mean, as talking to the coal people, they really believe that the way uh, the Obama administration's putting EPA rules in effect, that we're going to be forced to sell most of our, try to find most of our sales overseas. Do you think that's true? Yes, that's true, and it's happening. And it's happening in a very diversified manner. So when you look at our coal exports, they're just not going to one or two countries. They're going to several countries of significance. Uh, and so you look at Canada, Brazil is importing, Russia, India, different places are importing. So I think uh, uh, the, the, the co-export story is a very successful one. Now this year in particular, uh, the numbers are not as, as exciting. They don't seem to be as exciting in great part because there's been a slowdown in some of the uh, right. economies that we're exporting to, Brazil, India, China. But I think uh, the direction is exactly there. It's how do we uh, uh, sell more of this very important uh, uh, source of energy overseas if for whatever reason we cannot use it internally. I want to ask you some more questions about the West Virginia economy. I want to talk about the government shutdown, but I need to take a quick break sure. if you'll stay with us. Sure. All right, and don't forget, if you want to see this show or many of our old shows again, just go to statejournal.com or with the website of your favorite West Virginia media station and click on the Decision Makers tab. More with Zito after this. We now return to the State Journal's Decision Makers. 
Welcome back to Morgantown. We're continuing our conversation with the Dean of the West Virginia School of Business and Economics, Zito Zartarelli. Um, I want to go back. You were talking about personal income and how we've had above the national average for the last year or so. I guess my question is, as reading through your report, though, we are still fourth lowest in the nation in terms of personal income. I mean, we've we've got a lot of ground to make up to sort of not only catch that, but to also to get our growth because it, I thought I read that our growth, while positive, is still expected to be average about half of what the national economy does. Uh, going forward, yes. Yeah, well, no, it's a little more than average, but uh, I think that's an important element. In other words, and I mentioned that before also, Bray, is uh, sometimes we look at our uh, metrics and we get excited because we're doing a little better than the national average. I think the state of West Virginia will probably need to grow extremely fast. And I'm talking about five to six, seven percent per year for several years to make up for what we've lost. And so at $34,000 personal income per capita, that number today is uh, it's not a par where we should be. Uh, so we're at about 80 percent of the national average. Yeah. So we've made progress. We've come from about 75 or 70 percent of the national average, and we're making progress. But we should at least get to the national average. And, and, so, yes. and, and isn't, isn't this the time that West Virginia has the opportunity because we still, it looks like, have a good bit of energy economy yes. left in our future, right. that if, if we would fix our business law so that right. businesses were comfortable operating here, that they weren't going to get sued or face other other things that are seen as negative. We could have runaway growth in the state for a decade or two. There's no question about it. I think uh, economic development, as I mentioned to you at other meetings that we have had, is it's dependent on the availability of uh, natural resources, dependent on human capital, uh, capital formation ba based on technology, and also policy. So I think if there is one thing that we should be thinking constantly in this state is, are we, are we open for business? Are we attracting business? What are we doing to attract more and more business? And the question also is, and I, I mentioned this at the, the meeting, uh, is uh, what type of regulations we have in place that in any way or form may be impeding economic growth? And if they do exist, we should be working to change them, uh, to fix them so that we can attract uh, you know, faster economic growth for, for the state. There's nothing more import, important for the citizens of the state to have prosperity. And, and, and to do that, we're going to have to say, okay, for example, one of the things that sometimes we do is the assembly meets in Charleston as well, you know, they did not pass too many bills. Or well, many times, it's preferable not to pass any bills. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's preferable to say, let's look at the existing bills that we have, and are they, are they enablers of economic growth or are they not? If they're not enablers of economic growth, we may have to rethink about them. I think that's the part of mindset that we have to have to take this state to a growth of 5 to 7 percent sustained for the long term. Maybe, maybe they should just announce they're not going to meet for a decade and we'll see what happens, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> that's right. um, Speaking of the government not working very well, we've got this federal partial shutdown of our government. Do you see that as ultimately having any long-term impact on either our national or the world economy? Uh, it, it sort of functions how long it's going to last. And I think uh, uh, the shutting down of the government per se, uh, it's something that we should not be doing it, but it's, it's here and we have to live with it. We're going to resolve it. Uh, the impact economically, uh, it's not going to be substantial the way uh, economists are looking at it. I think the more important one is going to be, it's going to be the raising of the debt limit. If for whatever reason we decide not to do it or we decide to postpone it, that's going to create all kinds of problems because Economic economically. chaos. Oh, yeah, economic chaos. Because, you know, we'll free, uh, uh, credit will freeze up very quickly because there's always been, and I've lived overseas for many years in many countries, there's always been this trust in the U.S. economy and U.S. government so that they will do the right thing at the right time. So if for whatever reason tomorrow we said, okay, for whatever reason we're not going to pay our debt or we're not going, we're going to renege on those promises, this would be catastrophic. Even if it's a temporary Even thing. if it's temporary. That should never happen because I've seen so many countries who, for whatever reason, decide to renege on their commitments. That's a disaster. This country has always been, and the reason why the dollar is the uh, reserve currency of the world, because we in the world has trusted in the U.S., 
Now, if we start playing games and then we decide, look, uh, you know, whatever, you know, and we're not sure about our debt, et cetera, we have to be certain that those, whatever commits we've made, they have to be paid. And that's very important. How concerned are you at the same time about the United States overspending its budget versus its revenue. Oh, there's no, uh, that's a major that's issue. That's a long-term. Major, long-term, major issue. There's, you look at the economic history of the past 200 years, when a country like ours, we went from a creditor nation for many, many years, starting in, in, in the Depression, just before the Depression, in fact, to now a debtor nation. You cannot be a debtor nation forever. You have to have your house in order sometime in the future. So would you say that in summary, we need to figure out how to deal with the debt ceiling yes. and deal with yes. the debt? And there's no question about it because the other uh, element also is that, you know, talk whatever we talk about affordable uh, health care, uh, the act, uh, if in any way or form that is resolving a problem, which is, you know, providing insurance for many, many citizens of the country, but at the same time adding substantially to our deficit in the long term, that's a real problem. Well, Dean Zito Zartarelli, thank you, first of all, for your gift to West Virginia University. Thank you for your gift of yourself to this state and for being a part of us and leading the school into a time of dignity and uh, leadership. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Much. All right. Bob Huggins, standing by after this.